Welcome back, everyone. I've just um, started the recording for the, of this session. Okay, so I see the question that um, Charles has put in the chat. <coughs> Charles asked, um, how do you use the Bible to talk to an agnostic? Uh, yet he doesn't believe the Bible. And that's true. You know, um, as some people will not be willing to accept um, theological answers. That means uh, when we quote chapter and verse, uh, they they don't want to listen to it because they don't see the Bible the way we see it. For us, we see this is truth. Right? They don't see it that way. So what do we do? So uh, in most of the, or in, in such cases, <clears throat> we have to start off with either a philosophical approach or a scientific uh, evidence-based approach or a supernatural approach, meaning uh, we can't take the theological approach because they don't want <clears throat> they don't want to listen to what the Bible says, right? So as we look at some of the responses that we are going to have, give today and next week, uh, when we talk about the existence of God, creator and creation, we will have both a philosophical approach that is using simple logic or we will or not an or but and we will have a scientific approach which is using evidence based and say look at these things right so some people <clears throat> will listen to a, either a philosophical approach or a scientific evidence based approach then maybe they will you know, then they will open up later to a theological, what does the Bible say? Right? I think a great example of this approach is in Acts 17, when you <clears throat> think about the way uh, the apostle, uh, I'll, I'll just take a few minutes on this and get back to the course. Um, when you look at the way the apostle Paul approached uh, Athens, you know, Athens, uh, like we said, uh, was the intellectual capital <clears throat> of the world uh, at that time. Uh, prior prior to the Apostle Paul, 300 years before that, <clears throat> we had great philosophers uh, who had come out of Athens, the Greek philosophers. So Paul is coming into a city that is uh, very intellectual. They like to talk, they like to discuss and all of those things. What does Paul do? Um, Paul surveys the city. He gets a feel of what is, <clears throat> what are the things they connect with? And one of the things he notices at Athens at that time is, it's pretty uh, religious because they have uh, altars for every known god or goddess. And they even have an altar to the unknown god. You know, so that's the nature of the city. You know, they are spiritual. They are very philosophical. Uh, but <clears throat> they worship every kind of god and goddess and including to the unknown god. And Paul uses that as a starting point. So when he's called before Aeropagus, uh, which is the, the leaders of this whole intellectual city, and he's made to talk about Jesus, he starts with that. He says, you know, hey, guys, and I'm just paraphrasing it. So I walked around your city. You've got a beautiful city. Uh, and I noticed you have a lot of altars, a lot of to all kinds of gods. But I also noticed that you have an altar to the unknown gods. And I want to talk to you about that unknown God. <laughs> and he starts talking to them. You know, it's very interesting. So uh, the point is this. You start off where people are, right? If they are willing to receive philosophical explanation, okay, you use that. If they are willing to receive a scientific explanation, use that. Uh, if they are still very spiritual, supernatural people who want to you know, super spiritual, like the Jews require a sign, <clears throat> if they are there, okay, you start with that. And then, of course, eventually we'll have to lead them to this is what the Bible says, okay? Right, so let's get back to our course content. Um, I'll just share what we were talking about. Yeah, what we were. Uh, Louis, did you have a question or? Okay. All right. So talking about the existence of God, um, we're just going to quickly go through what we believe and then uh, how do we communicate that to 
either an atheist or agnostic. Uh, we will talk some of it today and then tomorrow, next week, uh, we'll get into creator and creation. It's all connected here, the existence of God, the existence of a creator and the creation. It's all connected. So it's actually one lesson that I've broken it down into smaller uh, portions. But when we put all this together, then we can formulate an answer, both a philosophical and a scientific answer to people. You know? But let's just clarify our own, our own position. You know, what do we believe? <clears throat> we believe in an infinite being. God is an infinite being who always existed and is self-existent, right? So the mountains, uh, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That means he, he's always been there and he always will be. You know, there is no beginning, no end for God. He's always been there. He is infinite. He counts the number of stars. He calls them by, na by name. His understanding is infinite. So God is great. He's beyond, you know, our ability to comprehend. And um, he's also... Uh, uh, self-existent and he doesn't be, you know, faint in his um, in his power so uh, he has endless power endless strength right and this God created the universe so we believe that that this eternal God always was there he created everything so the Bible tells us you know God created the heavens the earth and we believe that through him everything was made right and uh, and we also believe that he did this in seven days and you know we will we'll pick up some of the questions and i've kind of collected some of the questions that have come up in previous years uh, in previous batches so it'll be interesting just to look at those questions so one big question which we need to discuss is uh, how can we say god created the everything in seven days you know everything on earth seven days so genesis says you know he, six days he worked seventh day he rested so <clears throat> this was done in a week's time how do we say that? How do we defend that? That's a common question. So what we believe, we believe the Genesis account. Six days, God put everything on the earth that he wanted, and he rested the seventh day, right? So in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, Genesis, Exodus 20, verse 11, and all that is in them, right? So this is what we believe, and uh, everything came out of him. It starts, his it finds its purpose in him, right? And then we also believe, number three, that God created everything in an initial mature state. So, any interest to man? So, the Bible does not present an evolutionary process in creation. Why? Because God spoke and it was done. When God said, uh, let the earth bring forth, you know, the earth brought forth. When he made man, he didn't make a cell and wait for a thousand years, uh, uh, you know, a hundred thousand years for that cell to somehow become a man. No, he formed a mature man. He formed man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into him, and uh, he became a living being. And just, you know, just for illustration purpose, uh, you know, let's say God, Adam was created uh, one second earlier. And if Adam was brought to you and me today, and you ask, you know, how, how old is he? Uh, I'm just guessing, I don't know. But we would say, well, he's probably 50 years, 40 years old or something, a mature person. You know, we don't, we don't imagine Adam as a baby, you know, a two month old baby or a eight month old baby. No, we, from Genesis account, we see he was a mature man. And he was just in an instant formed. So in the creative act of God, three things came into play. Time, power, energy, and intelligence, design. So time, energy, and design was compressed into an instant. That's what we believe, that when God created, he created things in a mature form. That means, and I'm just repeating, in the creative act of God, time, energy, and design was compressed and expressed in an instant. 
none of these had to evolve. You know, so for ex example, in the evolutionary process, the underlying premise is that design evolves. So there is a gradual, slow improvement in design. That's the underlying premise. Now, in, in the way we live life, that is true. You know, uh, there is always an improvement in design. You know, you, you build a watch and over time, you know, you make it better. You build a car over time, you make it better. So in our realm of understanding and in our experience, that is how it is. Design improves over time, but not so with God. In the creative act of God, it, it you know, God is perfect. He's all wisdom. So design already was there. And in an instant, it was expressed when he said, uh, you know, let, uh, let the, you know, when he breathed into Adam, that in the, 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 when he formed man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into him in an instant, every aspect of the cell, the DNA and everything in the cell and all the organs, everything came into existence. The design came into existence in an instant. So what in our minds, takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy and is a process in the creative act of God took place in an instant. So that's what we believe based on scripture. You know, so God spoke, it was done. God breathed and it happened, right? Third, fourthly, what do we believe? We believe that God has given us proof of his existence. And... <clears throat> one of his biggest proofs or evidence of his existence is his creation. And so this is again a theological uh, point. And the point is in Ro you know, Romans 1, 19 to 22. Uh, can somebody read that for us? I know it's there in, in, in the notes, but it'd be nice to just read the scripture. Can somebody please read that for us? Romans 1, 19 to 22, please. I'll read, sir. All right. For a moment, I got a little scared. I thought everybody left the class. Okay, you're all there. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Maggie. Please read it. Okay. Roman 1, 19 to 22. It says, because, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they have they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thought, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay. So, what is Paul saying? And you know, in, in, in our third year, we are going to uh, study the Book of Romans, and it's going to be uh, a very fascinating study. But here, yeah, what is Paul saying? You know, he begins his whole uh, uh, teaching by beginning with the existence of God and the fact that God has given evidence of his existence in creation. He says, what we want to know about God, verse 19, what we don't want to know about God, he's made it very plain to us. God has shown it to us. So God is not hiding from us. God has made himself uh, uh, you know, he, he's revealed himself. And, and how has he done it? Verse 20, Paul says, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in his creation, in the things that he has made. So 
the attributes of God are revealed to us in his creation and that we can all understand. For example, you talk about the infinite attribute of God. You look at creation, it's infinite. You know, we just use certain numbers. We say, well, there are billions of stars or there are so many countless, you know, countless number of galaxies. Uh, we don't know how big this universe is, and we don't know if there could be other universes beyond ours. And basically, we are saying creation is infinite. Well, we are talking about the infinite attribute of God. It's revealed in creation. Uh, and like that, we can, you know, look into a single cell, and you you examine the cell, and uh, and you say, "Wow, there is so much, you know, design here." Well, that's the wisdom of God revealed in the things he has made. Or we look at the order in which things are happening around us. And we say, that's the wisdom of God. God is a God of order. Uh, you know. So the attributes of God are being have, have been revealed in the things he has made. So God, so as far as God is concerned, he said, Look, I've made myself known to you. And you are without excuse. That's end of verse 20. You, nobody, as far as God is concerned, nobody can say, God, you didn't tell me you were there. God is saying, hello, all around creation, I'm telling you I'm there. There's no excuse. But what is our problem? Verse 21. Even though we are looking at the evidence, you're turning away from it. Even though they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, but became foolish in their thoughts and you know, vain in their thoughts and foolish in their hearts, and they became fools. In other words, we are willfully choosing to turn away from the evidence. They knew God, but they don't want to glorify him as God. They're seeing the evidence, but they don't want to accept the evidence. Right? So that's our problem. Right? But as far as God is concerned, he's saying, look, I've made myself, given you evidence of my existence in the things I've made. And the scriptures, you know, in several places <clears throat> are pointing to that. They're saying, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, every day it, the creation is telling us God is. And uh, it's, uh, you know, Psalm 139. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the way we are made is, is showing us how marvelous, how great, his handiwork, yes, right? So ultimately, it's the fool who says there is no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. All right? So this is what we believe. Now, how do we present a case for the existence of God to an atheist and an agnostic and so on, right? So now <clears throat> we, we've uh, made, uh, we, we've, we've understood the positions of the atheists and agnostics. So I'm not going to repeat that uh, you know the atheist has uh, claimed infinite knowledge and the agnostic has said well you can't be sure so how do we respond to them right and uh, 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 you know and, and 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 people have made all kinds of uh, you know uh, statements uh, which are, are are really against what we just read in Romans one, right? So, so for instance, Bertrand Russell is supposed to have said, you know, when he stands before God, he will ask him, "Why did you give so little evidence of your existence? Why did you give so little evidence of your existence?" Interesting question. You're going to ask God, why did you give so little evidence of your existence? And God is saying, all of creation is staring you in the face, day and night, near and far, and saying, I am there. You know, so... This is how we are thinking. We are thinking, saying, oh, God, where are you? You're not giving any evidence. And God is saying, look, everything around you is an evidence 
of me being there. Okay, so, uh, so you know, and and just think about this whole thing. Um, when 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 people live without God, what implications? What are the ramifications of that? You know, when you say there is no God, immediately we are saying there is no moral law. There is no moral law. You know, and moral law can just be modified and redefined with time is what people are saying but that is actually against logic because logic says truth is timeless truth doesn't change with time truth cannot be redefined with time and truth does not degrade with time. A parallel to that in, in the physical world is light. And many times in scripture, truth and light are compared. The light we are receiving today is so many light years away and some of the light that is coming from distant stars are millions of light years away but you know it's still light it hasn't changed it is light light has not changed with time you know light years of time it is still light just an analogy in a physical realm therefore Truth is timeless. You know, just because this light has traveled so many millions of miles and comes to us many millions of light years away, doesn't change into something else. No, it is still light. It hasn't changed. Truth doesn't change with time. Truth cannot be redefined with time. Truth cannot degrade with time. That is truth. Otherwise, it is not truth. So, how a man without God redefines truth. It says, uh, you know, that's what they believed so many hundreds of years ago, but today we are different. We can adjust it like this. That means what was not acceptable then is okay now. So they redefine moral law. Okay. So that's what, that's one impact when man lives without God. Also, when man lives without God, what happens? Life becomes meaningless. Life is, uh, you know, what is the end, end, end the purpose of everything, you know? There is no ultimate meaning, uh, and so that's why you know uh, godlessness leads to despondency. It leads to a meaningless life. I mean, that just at some point, okay, okay, what was the purpose of my existence? Even if I contributed something meaningful, what was it for? What purpose would it serve? You know, so life becomes meaningless. There is no hope. Uh, you know, at the end of it, there's nothing to look forward to and there is no recovery. That means if uh, things go wrong, it's the end of everything. But this is the opposite when there is, when we believe in God and know that God is at work in our lives. Okay. So how do we uh, go about establishing or presenting a case for the evident existence of God? Number one. Okay. So this is a philosophical approach primarily, but then we will get into the scientific approach uh, as we extend this into the next uh, chapter, right? So first one is a philosophical argument, cause and effect, right? That means we say that you can't have an effect without a cause or every effect must have a cause. So we give a simple example. You know, if, uh, and, I, and you can think of any, lots of examples, just, just simple ones here. Suppose a ball, you're sitting in a room and a ball comes flying into the room. And we just say, well, it just appeared uh, and just came into the room. Would you accept it? No. Most often you're gonna look out the window to see who threw the ball. Why? 
because implicitly we accept this truth or this fact this cause and effect in everything that if we are seeing something happen there is a reason to that there is a cause to what the effect we are seeing so we would not you know uh, just simply say well oh, it just happened no there is a cause for every effect and so what we are saying is the creator is the cause for the creation uh, the, the universe had a beginning and therefore for that beginning to take place that cause is the creator god created so the cause and effect argument right number 2 we'll just go through this and then we can discuss okay number 2 similarly we extend the cause and effect to something more complex which is design or intelligence intelligence doesn't happen in a vacuum intelligence calls for an intelligent being design calls for a designer creation calls for a creator so when we say this is a second one again it's a philosophical statement a uh, philosophical argument we are saying look we know that design doesn't happen by chance design doesn't happen by chance design requires an intelligent designer you know so if i you know if i put something out there like if i put my mobile phone and uh, or you know you put a nice watch you know the, we used to have those old wrist watches with <laughs> two hands in it nowadays everybody most people have digital watches but anyway you know you put a, any device that we use these days and and suppose you told somebody hey this mobile phone just evolved here um it took just about 3 billion years uh, it all started with a few you know carbon cells and uh, somehow you know all these things just came and they assembled themselves so they landed here uh, you wouldn't believe that that's that's not no one will accept that say no there is so much of intelligence in in a single mobile phone uh, it, it's took the brains of many people to put that together because there is intelligence you we implicitly accept that it was the work of intelligent beings so that's the second argument and we will get into the scientific side of these things in the next chapter next next week the fact that there is so much design all around us in what we see is pointing to an intelligent designer okay the third argument a third thing that we can get people to consider you know and again uh, just to back up here you know one common example that you can use is uh, which people can easily relate to is you know if you have your uh, your uh, box uh, you know the scrabble um, pieces uh, you've got all these alphabets in it and let's say you have a box of these scrabble pieces and if you just throw it on the ground what is the probability that these pieces will assemble in intelligent words and form a sentence and actually create a very nice poem uh, that is like impossible period it's going to take somebody intelligent to put those pieces together to form intelligent sentence words uh, sentences and then paragraphs and become a poem so that's just another example you know you can keep trying how many how many other times you want through the scrabble pieces they're not going to fall nicely into some intelligent uh, meaningful uh, poem it's not going to happen 
Uh, let's finish this and then we will take up questions and discuss. Number three, the third philosophical argument uh, or reasoning we can present to people is the whole issue of morality and rationality. Now, if you have something which is just matter, you know, it's just matter, you have a stone. Can matter, lifeless matter, produce what we refer to as morality, which is a sense of right and wrong? And can lifeless matter produce rationality, which is a sense of reason? The ability to analyze logic and establish truth. You know? So this, this conscious mind that we have, this sense of right and wrong, the sense of morality and rationality, could it come out of lifeless matter? Because what ultimately we are saying is, even though at this point in time, I mean, we have, we already have the capacity of morality and rationality. If you're going back to the whole, um, theory of the world coming out of all of creation or you know the, the, the uh, nature coming out of matter so whether they were just these cells or, or sorry these carbon atoms and and then they evolved 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 there was this big explosion and you know matter formed and then out of that some you know what we call as life came in but ultimately we are saying we are all matter. If I am just matter, what about the conscious mind and what about rationality? What is that? Can matter produce this? Can matter somehow evolve and acquire a sense of morality and rationality? So, Again, this is a silly example, but take a stone, put a rock here, and leave it for a hundred thousand years. Will the rock in some way be able to acquire a sense of morality and rationality? Can it somehow evolve into that? No. So Matt so if I am just matter and if I have evolved over time into where I am from just matter, then where did I get the ability for morality that something is right, something is wrong? And the ability to have reason and logic, where did that come from? So again, this is a philosophical question because matter can acquire it and matter by itself cannot evolve into it. So what we say is this capacity had to be imparted to created beings. And we have higher level, we as human beings, we have an, a different sense of morality and rationality. We, we're not like animals, we're not, you know, we're not like that. We have a higher sense of morality and rationality. So it has to be something that was given to us rather than something we acquired if we were just matter that has evolved to a higher state. Lastly, is the supernatural phenomena, right? So the first three were philosophical arguments. The fourth one is a spiritual supernatural argument, which is, hey, what about people? What about supernatural phenomena? And we, we, we can talk about example is demons. Have you seen people who are demon possessed, how they behave? And some of us have. And the phenomenon of demonic possession cannot be, uh, what is it, cannot be disregarded because it's real. You know, you can see it. You know, you know when we go on ministry and mission to people, you see demonic manifestations. I mean, it's there, you see people. And it cannot be explained. 
psychologically. You know, psychologists and psychology only takes us so far in mental illness problems. But demonic manifestations are paranormal. It's, it's beyond what can be explained by psychology. And then you see them being delivered in the name of Jesus. And you see them being restored to no normalcy and uh, being fine. But this was the same person who was manifesting or went through all of that. But now the same person is fine. There was no, you know, how do you explain it? And it was all done in the name of Jesus. So this is just one example of a supernatural phenomena, something happening in the name of Jesus. And if the name of Jesus was not real, not powerful, this change would never have happened. That means there is something to that name, which is pointing to us to the existence of someone beyond the realm of our, what we can see and understand. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. We're going to have a time for question and discussion. So let's just quickly uh, summarize what we are, what we did today, and then we can, um, uh, uh, we can take up some things to, you know, discuss here, All right? So what we have said is, what we did today is simply we said, okay, you know, this is what we believe about God. You know, God is eternal. God is infinite. God is powerful. God is creator. From, from the Bible point of view, this is what we believe. And we believe that what the Bible is saying about creation is true, that uh, God created everything. And uh, the things that are on the earth, he, you know, he did it just like it says in Genesis 1. Six days he did it, and seventh day he rested. Uh, so that is what we believe is that in creation, time, energy, and design was all put together in an, uh, well, it all just came together in an instant, which is the creative act of God. We believe that. But there are people who don't believe that. And broadly speaking, there are atheists and there are agnostics. So, how can we, you know, uh, share with them what we believe? Uh, we gave today three philosophical statements, one from a spiritual, supernatural perspective. Next week, we get into scientific, okay? So philosophical statements, one, cause and effect. And now these philosophical statements, many people will accept, you know, those who like to think through, would think through and say, yeah, I understand what you're saying, right? So cause and effect. We understand that for every effect that we see, there has to be a cause. The light comes on because somebody turned on the switch, right? Second, uh, we talked about design and designer. Intelligence doesn't happen by chance. It cannot happen at random. It happens because there is an intelligent being. A second argument. Third, philosophical argument. So first cause and effect, design, designer. Third philosophical argument is lifeless matter cannot somehow acquire morality and rationality. Cannot. Impossible. We will accept that. So, if I am just a matter, just made up of cells that are somehow functioning intelligently, well, first of all, how did my cells start functioning intelligently? Secondly is, how come this lifeless matter acquire morality and rationality? Where did it come from? Okay. So these are three philosophical arguments. And then one is a supernatural argument. Okay, there's the reality of demon possession and deliverance. How do you explain that? Okay, so we can present these to people who are willing to listen, 
get them to think, right? And then next week, we continue with this class. We will talk about creator and creation from a scientific perspective for those who are interested in those kinds of uh, discussion, okay? Um, let me just look at the comments that are in the chat and see any. Okay, we answered Charles, Rose. Man, it's convinced it has no what he sees to send the thing. I see, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's John 20. Kennedy, if Christians think that God creates and like do not care. All right. Let's see Kennedy's question here. I'm trying to understand the question. Um, if creation is infinite, did God create sin, like do not kill, kill by the angels? Hmm. I'm trying to understand the question. Did God create sin? Um, Kennedy, Kennedy, I'm not sure if I understood your question, but let me, you know, I think your question is, did God create sin, right? So let's go back to the very first sin that we see in the Bible. And when you think about it, it's very, very interesting. The first sin that we have recorded for us in the Bible took place in heaven. It took place in the very presence of God. It took place in the most glorious presence of God. There was Lucifer. He was called the son of the morning. And, uh, you know, you can imagine somebody standing before God. He is the archangel, the chief of the worship angels of God, were in charge of the worship of God. And he is there in the very glory presence of God. And yet this angel, Lucifer, son of the morning, the worship angel, full of wisdom and beauty, he sinned. Where did this sin come from? There was no evil. There's no evil at all. God had not created anything. What was his sin? It was a sin of pride. What led to that sin? Self-deception. Self-deception led to the first sin. The first sin was pride. We know it because Isaiah 14 and also 1 Timothy chapter 3 identify this for us. Isaiah 14, we read about uh, Lucifer saying, you know, I will ascend to the most, to the throne of the most high. I will be like the most high. And I will, you know, he, it was all about I will. And then 1 Timothy 3, um, give you the exact verse, the apostle Paul, uh, and so verse 6, verse Timothy 3, 6, Paul says, you know, look, this was the sin of Lucifer. He fell into pride. Pride. But how did it happen? Did somebody tempt him or anything? No. What caused him to go into pride? It was self-deception. He deceived his own self. What is self-deception? It is to think something wrong about yourself, which is you know, to think about yourself which is something that is not true. He thought he could become like God. So that was the first sin. So God didn't create that. It was Lucifer's own self-deception to think that he could become like God, right? So to answer your question, Kennedy, God did not create Sin. So when we say God is infinite and God created everything, he didn't create evil, right? He didn't create evil. It came out of the first sin of self-deception and so on. And that's why, you know, you, you find in James, in the book of James chapter one, you know, he warns us so much against self-deception because that is the highest, I mean, I would say like, the first sin, you know, Lucifer committed. I, I don't know if I answered your question, Kennedy, but uh, I tried Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Charles. Uh, okay, Charles was making a comment. I need this question. Um, we say that angels are ministering spirit. They were created to magnify his glory. Then how is it that Lucifer had a desire to be like God? I don't understand. Um, 
yeah so uh, anita like even i don't understand because this is something very hard for us to comprehend how could an angel of god a created being of god who was so endowed with wisdom and beauty and all of that how could that angel have this wrong thinking right how could that yeah so i see uh, tarun's sharing the he says free will yeah that is true right so god has given us all uh, the freedom to think and make our choices and all of that and so this angel chose to think like this you know i will take the place of god now how could he have come to that conclusion i don't know right i mean i, I don't have an answer how could he have come and maybe he he was so great great and he thought well it's easy to become like god maybe he forgot that he was a created being i don't know but this is what the scripture tells us happened and uh, you know that's that's what we believe and uh, how could that angel think like this i don't know yeah right so um yeah so uh, angelic beings yeah shikma we could we could say that angels have a free will uh, because they are choosing to be aligned to god whereas some angels chose to depart from god if they didn't have a free will they would not have been allowed to do that right but some angels chose to depart you know we read about in revelation 12 um where uh, satan drew a third of the angels with him Uh, and 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 he was cast out of heaven so um um was for revelation 12:4 right so obviously lucifer and the angels that chose to go with him but also deceived so that means not only did lucifer deceive himself but he ended up deceiving one out of every three angels a third of the angels and they chose to go with him so that's why we say you know angels have a free will but the angels that are with god today have chosen to be there in the presence of god okay good good question so um we're going to close here today uh, i want you to continue to think about these things and come with questions next week as we develop this so what we are going to be discussing again next week is an extension of what we did today today we just talked about the existence of god next week we're going to talk about creator and creation okay it's an extension of what we dis- discussed today how do we talk to people about the existence of a creator and creation okay so think about it if you have come up with your questions next week will be a little bit more scientific we will get into some scientific aspects and um as we present and then uh, to people and we'll discuss it and then you know, th- th- i'm sure that will generate some thoughts and some questions and we can discuss it okay uh let's close in prayer i want somebody to please pray with us and dismiss us we'll get ready for our next class anyone can pl- please pray all right somebody let me um want to pray rupa you want to pray okay sir father god we come to your throne of grace master thank you for this time of enlightenment father we father we stand in awe of your creation and the way you made everything so beautiful by the god we just stand in awe of your design of everything master we thank and praise you as we continue to 
learn at your feet lord open our eyes of understanding father help them. father let the truth be hidden in our hearts lord and help us to be your faithful father witnesses in spreading that truth thank you for the pastor and thank you for each one of us lord father thank you for this privilege of knowing you and loving you and following you in jesus name amen 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 thank you thank sir. you thank you everyone we'll pick this up next week have a quick break and we'll join in the other class thank you bye now thank you pastor god bless everyone thank you thank you pastor thank you thank you everyone god